Hi, Amsterdam. Today, I'm excited to share with you some of Microsoft's projects in AI for Good. Microsoft's AI for Good initiative covers four broad swaths. AI for Earth, AI for Cultural Heritage, Humanitarian Action, and Accessibility. Today, we'll be focusing in on AI for Earth and Cultural Heritage and look how we're using Apache Spark to solve problems for wildlife conservation and art museum outreach. So the first project I want to take you on a deep dive of is a collaboration that we have between the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City and MIT. This took place over a three-day hackathon where it brought together people from the space of technology, art museum curation, and artists themselves to see whether we can make a difference in improving um, experiences at the Met. This was in celebration of two years of open access at the Met a program where over 400,000 works of art were made digitally available under the open access license, not only democratizing the museum experience for people all over the world, but also allowing technologists to get to play with this data set and really explore over 5,000 years of human culture um, in one of the richest uh, collections of art on the planet. So, when we got access to this data set, we had a few key goals. And the first one that we all thought of was, how do we give museum visitors and people online the thrill of creation that has inspired artists for generations? And so, and we also wanted to empower them using kind of techniques from modern deep learning. So the architecture that we settled on is called the Progressive GAN, or ProGAN. And this is a, a system of two algorithms that compete against each other in order to generate realistic looking images. One of them creates art and the other one critiques it and determines what it can do better. And these algorithms slowly grow over time. So quite like a human being, you know, they crawl before they walk and they learn to create small images before scaling up to full 1024 by 1024 images. And so this allows us to create art in a machine and let a, a user actually exper experiment and play with this art generation process. Once we've trained this model, we can use the Azure Machine Learning Service in order to deploy it into the cloud. We use a technique that we use frequently at Microsoft called MLOps, which is DevOps for machine learning, that really encompasses the entire machine learning workflow. It starts a collaboration on GitHub where it could, uh, you can take your code and deploy it, build it using Azure pipelines and ML flow, and make a full production web app, and then monitor it using the Azure Machine Learning Data Drift Toolkit in order to determine when you need to de redeploy your app or retrain your app. The final product is an algorithm that can make some really exciting pieces of art that um, are unlike a lot of the things that were already in the museum's collection. This is one of my particular favorites. It's hanging up on my wall back home. And you see that the algorithm learns a lot about the museum's collection. It learns to stick all of its creations on the stereotypical gray background from the Met. It learns the canonical apple-shaped vase form from European decorative arts. And it brings in components from other cultures, like the shimmering blue porcelain of Egyptian faience and gold of the Metropolitan Museum's jewelry collection. In addition to creating new works of art and letting users kind of take the helm of that, we also wanted to experiment with allowing users to see the collection in new ways and to see the collection on their own terms, to kind of bring the collection to an audience that ordinarily might not go to the museum. The idea was to take a user's Instagram feed or user uploaded images and find the closest match in the Metropolitan's collection, not just in terms of pixels, but in terms of the high level semantic details. We built this algorithm on Azure Databricks using Spark ML. We took the entire Metropolitan's collection, we featureized it with a deep network. We got these tight, pithy features that really capture the semantic um, content of these images. And in this feature space, distance really corresponds to the high-level meaning of, of image similarity that you and I might have. And so we can build a fast nearest neighbor lookup tree with Spark ML's bucketed locality-sensitive hashing algorithms to create um, an end-to-end -end 
nearest neighbor search just specifically on the Metropolitan Museum's collection. We can then deploy this to the cloud with Azure Machine Learning and play around with it for fun. So what I like the most is not just when this algorithm spits out what you'd expect, but when you get kind of the unexpected serendipitous moments. So this is my cat Tupelo, and I was uh, really excited when the algorithm spit out this ridiculous piece. <laughs> and I laugh at this every time. And so it's not quite right, but it's not quite wrong either. And uh, <laughs> it really makes you think hard about what is this kind of thing that we're picking up on of similarity, and, and what are the canonical forms of images that we work with in the day to day. And most importantly, it gets you to laugh. And if it gets you to laugh, it gets others to laugh and gets people to think um, about art in maybe a different way than the way they do at the actual physical museum. And finally, we wanted to use this collection to help people explore. Because the Metropolitan Museum only displays about 1% of their art on the walls in the physical space. The majority of their art is kind of sitting in a back room just waiting for its day in the light. So we wanted to bring that to light and let users explore the entire collection. So we created an intelligent search engine using Apache Spark. And I'll briefly go over kind of how we built this and the general paradigm. We used Azure Databricks and Spark to pull in a large collection of images from the map. We piped these through the Azure Cognitive Services on Spark. These are Microsoft's hosted deep models in the cloud that can take these images, annotate them with people, objects, faces, ages, can describe the images if they don't already have descriptions, and can take the curatorial notes and annotate them with things like entities, dates, locations, and places, tie them in with knowledge bases like Wikipedia. And finally, once we have all of this structured information on our Spark cluster, we can use our Spark bindings for Azure Search to kind of pump all of this data out in a distributed fashion into a distributed search index that's managed in the cloud. All of this is on an Azure Databricks cluster, so it's scalable and elastic. And it's fairly easy to do, only a few lines with our open source technology, Microsoft Machine Learning for Apache Spark. This library is designed to be the home of Microsoft's open source contributions to Apache Spark. We started as a distributed machine learning library that boasted things like distributed deep learning with Microsoft's Cognitive Toolkit and GPU-enabled gradient-boosted trees with LightGBM. Most recently, we've added fast and sparse text analytics with Vopal Wabbit, and there's several other machine learning packages integrated into the Apache Spark ecosystem. But in addition to machine learning, a key piece is actually deploying these models. And a lot of you probably use Spark because of its beautiful flexibility between being a batch processing system and a stream processing system without changing your API. And so we've added a third leg to this generality, which is using the same data frame API, you can automatically deploy your models as a distributed web service on your cluster without changing your code. In addition to using Spark as a web service creation system, you can use it to communicate with the world as a distributed web client. We take the entire HTTP protocol and we bind it into Spark SQL so that you can communicate with whatever kind of component or architecture you're working with in your particular work. For us, we use this to expose all of the Azure Cognitive Services to the Spark ML ecosystem, but we really hope that this could be a general purpose way to integrate a lot of things into the Spark ML in a principled and efficient way. Finally, everything we have in this library is automatically exposed to things like Python and R, so that you can use these technologies in whatever language that you feel most comfortable with or have your existing Spark stack set up in. And we're excited to announce that today we're releasing our first release candidate. So please give it a shot, try out our APIs, and let us know what you'd like to see in our final GA release. So, Coming back to the Metropolitan Museum, we've seen how we can use kind of open source technologies and scalable machine learning to tackle three kind of problems that might be posing an art museum. And what we really want is a single application that kind of exposes all of these and unifies them together. And so with that, I'd like to introduce my collaborator, Christina Lee, who can show you how to build a single application that unifies creation of art, exploration of art, and search into a single website that you all can access after this demo. So, yeah. Hello, everyone. 
I am thrilled to demo to you the work that we've done with the Metropolitan Art Museum. So as Mark mentioned, we had a few problems we wanted to solve. We wanted to help people create new art, and we wanted to help people interact with the art in a new way, and we wanted to help them explore the collection. So in this demo, I'm going to show you how we went about achieving those goals by creating an intelligent search engine and deploying a reverse image search service. And I quite won't go into the deploying generative art model, but I'll show you the website that has all of these pieces together. And of course, all of these needs to be built on first on the metropolitan collection data. So we'll start there. So I'm loading the data into a data frame. And you'll see that there are about 170,000 images in this particular data set. And also, there are about 50 different metadata fields that could potentially tell us about all of these artworks. However, upon closer inspection, you'll see that this data set turns out to be quite sparse. Not all of the, not all the fields are filled in for all of the artworks. So what that means for us is that in order to get information about these artworks, relying solely on these metadata fields isn't going to give us a lot of information because the amount of semantic information you can get on artworks will vary depending on the artwork. And to help people to help people explore the art, what we really wanted to do was create an intelligent search uh, search engine that can return to the users that uh, easily based on uh, artworks easily based on what they were looking for. But given the sparsity of this data set, we had to first imbue this with more, um, enrich the data set, and imbue this with more semantic information to gain a deeper understanding of the artwork. So how did we do that? And so this is where we leverage cognitive services on Spark. And for those of you who are not familiar with Azure Cognitive Services, uh, they are a suite of pre-built cloud AI capabilities running the gamut from computer vision to anomaly detector and everything in between. And for this demo, we'll focus specifically on the computer vision side of things. And so with Cognitive Services, what computer vision does is it, given an input image, it gives you a whole host of visual information. And with Cognitive Services on Spark as part of Microsoft ML for Apache Spark, what you can do is you can use this cloud AI, cloud AI service at scale using an easy to use data transformer on Spark. So you can get all of this visual intelligence that computer vision can give you using just a few lines of code. And this can get all the visual intelligence for all of the images in our data set. So let's see what we got here. So one of the things that computer vision service gives you is what content category an image falls into. Is it giving me, is it depicting people? Is it depicting outdoor scenes, indoor scenes, buildings, what have you? And so what that means for our data set is that now with this information, I can tell users, OK, this image might be something you're interested in based on the content that you're looking for. So say I'm interested in images about people. And I want to look at specifically the artworks that are specifically about young people. Then I can just find the artworks that are about young people and then look at them and also get a whole host of other information based on the outputs from other computer vision services. For example, like how many faces are there and some information about those faces. And this really only scratches the surface of what you can do with computer vision. Maybe you want to curate this collection for a younger audience, so you want to take out some of the more explicit artworks, then you can do that using the adult content filter. Or maybe you want to make this more accessible for those who are visually impaired, and you can do that with a descriptive captioning. And the amount of intelligence you can get on this collection increases, increases a lot more when you start adding other cognitive services on top of what we already did. Maybe you want to run text analytics named entity recognition on the curated descriptions there. So now that we've enriched this data and we've added all these intelligent annotations, how, how do we do the search engine part of the intelligent search engine? Well, with MLML Spark, what you can do is you can take a whole data frame on Spark and upload it and index it on Azure Search so that you can easily create a search engine that users can query, and it'll include all of these intelligent annotations. And you can do that with code that looks and feels like any other data frame writer. So with just a few lines of code that is, at the end of the day, data frame dot write to Azure Search, you can take all of this data with all of its intelligent annotations and put it in an Azure Search, and that way we can create our intelligent search engine. Another thing we wanted to do was let users interact with the collection in new ways. And 
what we wanted to do was we wanted to create a way for users to interact with the art collection in a fun way. So let users come with an image of their favorite things. Maybe it's a scene, maybe it's their pet, what have you. And tell them, hey, this artwork in this metropolitan collection is quite similar to the thing that you really like. And so to do that, we created a reverse image search service. And as Mark mentioned, here's how it works on a high level. We take an image, we featureize it into deep features using fast ne nearest neighbor lookup. We find the closest match in the collection. And, and using Spark ML, we can do that in just a few lines of code. We can make a model that does exactly that in just a few lines of code. And now that we've created this model in Spark, we want to make it into a service so that people can actually use it. And with Azure Machine Learning, you can take a Spark model and easily turn it into a, into a web service so users can actually pipe their images through and see what the result is. Maybe it'll be something legitimately similar, like the snowy scenery image that Mark showed, or maybe it'll be something funny, like Mark's cat. And the last piece I want to talk about briefly is the creating new art part. Um, and we did this using the generative art model. While I won't quite go into details on how we did that in the interest of time, I do want to show you the website where all of the, these pieces come together. And we, we released this publicly, called, uh, publicly available website called Gen Studio, where visitors can create new art using different combinations of art pieces in the Met collection, find art pieces that are similar to it, and explore the artwork. So let's take a look. So here we're in Gen Studio, and you can start by selecting an art piece that you want to start with. And then from there, you can explore the space between different art pieces. And then in the background, we use a generative art model to create an artwork that is a combination of all these, uh, a combination of different aspects of all these artworks. And so once you find, once you find something you like, you can use the reverse image search service that we talked about to find the artworks that actually resemble the one that you just created. So these are artworks that are actually in the collection. And from there, you can go to the Metropolitan Museum's official website to learn more about those artworks. So a quick recap, we've created an intelligent search engine to help users explore the art collection. We created a reverse image search service to help users engage with the collection in a new way. And we used the, we used the creative, um, creating new artwork using generative art model to kickstart all of this exploration. Thank you, and back to you, Mark. So Christina showed us how we can do this all in only a few lines of code on Azure Databricks, and that's kind of why we built this, is to make all of these kinds of things much easier to do on a scalable platform. And so, I want to also share with you some work that we've been doing in AI for Earth with the Snow Leopard Trust, a small nonprofit devoted to monitoring and protecting the endangered snow leopard. Some of you might have heard that snow leopards are considered no longer endangered, but this isn't quite the full story. The Snow Leopard Trust and several other organizations have concluded that it might be a little early in order to actually declare these no longer endangered and that we need a lot more data in order to be sure that we're uh, at before we lift the snow leopard off of the list. And so the Snow Leopard Trust and several other countries across the globe have decided to pool all of their remote camera trapping together, camera trapping data together, in order to get one of the largest views of the snow leopard population to date. One of the most difficult things with motion sensitive camera trap data in the wild is that there's a lot of cruft in this data set. A lot of things move in the Himalayas. And so here's one particular example. Can you tell which photo actually has a snow leopard in it? And yeah, it's, uh, it's not that easy for humans, and it's not that easy for machines either. And so we estimate that this will take around 20,000 human hours in order to go through and pull out these leopards from the million images. So what we really want is to create an algorithm to do this automatically and to leverage as small amount of data as possible and kind of stretch that data as far as it will go. So what do you do when you have a new problem? You bing it, I guess. <laughs> so you, we can bing search for all of these images of snow leopards to kind of automatically create a labeled data set. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we can create a full labeled data set without actually needing any labeled data ourselves by 
pulling these images straight out of Bing for leopards and for rocky mountainsides, rocky crags, snowy mountainsides. And we can stitch these together with the small amount of labeled data that we do have to create a much larger and much more robust labeled data set. We can use Microsoft Machine Learning for Apache Spark to train a deep image classifier that extracts out um, a, a good classification system. It uses pre-initialized weights from ResNet 50 so that it converges with a much smaller amount of data, has much better sample complexity. But we don't just want to determine whether or not a leopard is in an image. We want to determine the difference between one narcissistic leopard and a variety of incredibly camera-shy leopards. And lucky for us, the leopard spots kind of serve like the human fingerprint. They can uniquely identify the leopard across several different camera traps. However, previously this was an incredibly time-consuming effort. It was like CSI Kyrgyzstan. They spread out all the images around and they were just looking and it was incredibly prone to human error. And it's a very difficult task. You know, our brains are not wired for this sort of thing. Thankfully, there's several algorithms in the literature, namely Hotspotter, that can do this with any sort of pattern species. But the catch is that you need a tight crop on the leopard. You don't just need a yes or no, a leopard is in this photo, you need a bounding box surrounding this leopard. And so this might be the point where you think, oh, we need to start labeling, we need to get some human beings out here, draw some boxes, but we can kind of go further and still t extract some more blood from this stone in that it would be ridiculous if we had a trained classifier that didn't know where the leopard was, that could tell us that yes, there was a leopard, but didn't know why or where. So we can extract this information from a trained classifier using Lime on Spark as part of Microsoft ML for Apache Spark. So what this does is ask which pixels actually are, belong to the leopard. And we find that it really follows the leopard as it moves across the ecosystem and is a fairly good proxy for human supervision that doesn't require any human input whatsoever. And of course, you can always add human labels as well to make this a little bit more efficient. And so with that, I want to share with you some words from Kostub Sharma, the, the researcher who's out in Kyrgyzstan and actively organizing this kind of large initiative. With AI, we can protect what we can't see. Snow leopards are almost impossible to find but we need to know where they are because they are threatened. Our camera traps allow us to have an eye in the mountains, taking thousands of pictures. Microsoft AI scans through all these images and separate snow leopards from everything else. In 10 minutes, instead of 10 days, it gives us time to do better research and save this threatened species. So, to recap, We've seen how scalable machine learning can be used to tackle problems in cultural heritage and AI for Earth. But these are only two pillars of Microsoft's AI for Good initiative. In San Francisco, at the Spark Summit, we showed how a very similar architecture as the Snow Leopard architecture could be used to do currency detection to help those with visual impairments. Researchers in Microsoft are working with the World Bank um, in order to predict famine to better target resources. And we believe that global scale solutions require global scale collaboration. And so that's why Microsoft has put forward $115 million in the form of grants to support AI for good type research. So if you or any of your collaborators are working in these types of fields, definitely check out the website and apply. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. I've thrown a few links up here if you're interested in learning more. Definitely check out um, some of the other sessions on cybersecurity, MLflow, and Azure ML. And have a great rest of your Spark Summit.